Uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Rishut Kahal Kadosh. It's a distinct privilege to be here tonight, specifically for the fact that it's being sponsored by <coughs> a great organization, Tomche Shabbat. I know we have uh, a similar branch where I come from in Brooklyn, New York, and I'm aware of the great work that they do on a weekly basis. And after hearing some of the statistics, uh, how many deliveries and the routes, it's very, very impressive. I'm most uh, excited about the volunteers. I'm a big fan of volunteers, even more than professionals. Somebody once asked, what is your uh, infatuation with volunteers? So I reminded them that volunteers built Noah's Ark, professionals built the Titanic. <laughs> so the fact that we have these volunteers that are the Shem Shamaim and doing their work, it's really incredible. May God pay them back. The Shabbat clearly will pay them back because it is the source of all blessings. And for all the donors <clears throat> that give money to this great organization, well, I remind you what the Gemara says in Betzah. Kol mezonotav shel adam kitsuvim lo metishri ad tishri chutz metishri. Sounds like some sort of a poem. That all the money that a person makes is already earmarked. It is already established. Metishri ad tishri. Tishri being Rosh Hashanah ad tishri. The next Rosh Hashanah. That means the fiscal year for our Parnasa is from Tishri at Tishri. But the Gemara says, Hutz mit Tishri. That we get some exemptions. Certain things do not impact the bottom line. Which means God pays for these things and it doesn't come out of our, our net. And that is Tishri. Tishri is an acronym. The TAF, of course, stands for Talmud Torah. The money that we spend on yeshivas and teaching our children, it's on God's bill. The sheen, of course, stands for Shabbat. And that's where Tomchei Shabbat supporters come in. It's money that's revolving. Whatever you give out comes right back in. Resh is Rosh Chodesh, tonight being Rosh Chodesh. So tonight's event is actually sponsored by God himself. And the Yud would be Yamim Tovim. Chutz Metishri, Torah, Shabbat, Rosh Chodesh, and Yom Tov. That's on God's bill. So, Hazak Baruch to the organization, to its volunteers and its supporters. <clears throat> I was asked to speak tonight, and I had asked them if there was a topic that was uh, announced. And I was emailed back very promptly. It's on the, it's on the flyer. I looked at the flyer and it said something to the uh, something to the amount of being apart while standing apart. Uh, by a show of hands, does anybody know what I'm supposed to speak about tonight? <laughs> okay, good. I don't feel so dumb. <clears throat> but I, I took a crack at it. <clears throat> Whether it's the topic that was intended, I'm not too sure. But because I'm a little realist, I want to keep to the program. So this is my version of being apart while standing apart. Well, clearly the Jewish people must stand apart. And the Torah says it explicitly. Hen am levadad yishkon. Ubagoyim lo yitchashav. Hen am levadad yishkon. It's a nation that's levadad. The nature of the Jewish people is that they must be isolated. Lebadad means alone. Ubagoyim lo yitchashav. They should not have too much association with the rest of the world. Ubagoyim lo yitchashav. And the rabbis in the Talmud questioned the word hen. He nun sofit. Well, why does the Torah refer to the Jewish people as hen? Hen am. 
The pasuk could have said, "Am levadad yishkon." What's the hen? And the Gemara says something incredible about those two letters. A novelty. Those two letters are like no two other letters in the Hebrew alphabet. Because if you take, for example, the letter Aleph, and you want to get to the number 10, which is a complete number, so you need an Aleph and a Tet. An Aleph and a Tet gets you to 10. Well, if you take a Bet, a Bet and a Het will get you to 10. And a Gimel and a Zion gets you to the same place. And a Dalet and a Vav. The He stands alone. It has no partner to get to the number 10. Where the first four letters of the alphabet have a partner, the He is alone. Well, then the Hachamim say, let's try to get to 100. So they say, well, you have to take a Yud. Well, if you take a Yud and you take a Tzaddi, you get 100. If you take a Chaf and a Peh, you get to 100. If you take a Lamed and an Ayin, you get to 100. If you take a Mem and a Samech, you get to 100. But when you get to the Nun, it has no partner. The Jewish people are Hen. They're like the letters He and Nun. They stand alone. They're not supposed to uh, assimilate. They're not supposed to get involved with any other nation. Hen am lebadad yishkon. And that's the source of our blessing. As the pasuk could be read as follows. Hen am lebadad, when the Jewish people are alone and they're committed to their own values. Yishkon. Yishkon means they'll exist. They'll have blessing. However, the pasuk says, Ubagoyim. Once they start to go out and start to learn from the nations that are around them, ubagoyim lo yithashav, they lose their importance. They lose their credibility. And if this is the topic, then I think the Megillat Esther that we're about to read is a perfect example of what happens when Jewish people go out of their borders and go out to impress and to be part of the society, and they get too close, or as we would say, out of bounds. The Gemara Megillah questions, what was the reason why the Gezerav Haman came? What sin did the Jewish people commit in order to arouse the anti-Semitism of Haman HaRasha, Lehashmid, Leharog, Ulabed? And the Gemara says clearly, because they went to the Sa'uda Bahashverosh and they were Nehene. And I asked, they were Nehene from the Sa'uda. The way I learned it when I was young, they told me there was kosher food. It says La Asot Kinson Ish Vaish. They wanted to satisfy everybody. Even the Jewish people were satisfied. Today it's not uncommon where people go to the White House and they serve them kosher food. People have business meetings abroad and they serve them kosher food. On an airplane, you get kosher food. <coughs> if that's called food. <laughs> so Hashverosh was able to get a, 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 a kosher caterer, I'm sure. So what's the problem? They ate kosher food. Hakamim say, Mordechai uh, uh, saw, saw to it that he was the wine steward, there was kosher wine. So what's the problem? The problem is, why were the Jewish people so excited to go to such a party of Hashverosh was the epitome and the antithesis of what we stand for. It's one thing to go to the party out of duress. It's one thing to go because you have to go. But when the Pasu, the Gemara says, Al Shenehenu, Nehenu means they didn't just go with a chain and a leash attached to them. They didn't go as an onus. They didn't go by force. They went and they enjoyed it. And that's the beginning of the end. That once the Jew leaves his culture and he starts to get excited of other cultures and he starts to go and he leaves his borders, that already arouses the gezerot of the goyim. As the Hafez Haim once said in a very sharp quip, he said, if the Jew does not make kiddush, the goy will make havdalah. And it's clear what he meant. Kiddush in this sense he meant that we have to separate ourselves, not to be so uh, uh, involved, not to be so upfront at the culture level. But if the Jew doesn't make Kiddush, if he doesn't separate himself, that arouses 
the anti-Semitism of the Goyim, and they make the Havdalah, they push us back to where we belong. The Jew is different. There was a great rabbi called Kuzari. Again, it, I don't know the rules in this country, but if I would say this too loud in the country that I come from, I would probably be called a racist or some sort of, uh, some sort of uh, person that's prejudiced. But I'm quoting the Kuzari. The Kuzari says that there's four parts of creation. He says they go from the lowest form to the highest form. The lowest form being domem. Domem is an inanimate object. The table is a domem. A rock is a domem. Higher than that is a tzomeyah. That's something that grows, a plant. After the tzomeyah, you have high. That's the animal life. And above the high is the midaber, is the human being that speaks. That's ham. Domem, tzomeyah, high, midaber. And of course, there is no connection between each one of these. The distance between a domem and a tzomeyah is light years away. You cannot compare a rock to a plant or a tree that produces fruit. And you cannot compare a tree that produces fruit to an animal that's a living being. And certainly you cannot compare an animal to human beings that have the ability to think and make decisions and speak. Each level in the Datsham is very far from each other. But then the Kuzari says there's a fifth level. And the fifth level he refers to as the Jew, the Yehudi. It sounds prejudice. But he puts the Jew in a different class. And the distance between Domem and Someyach and Someyach and Hai and Hai Medaber, that's the difference between Medaber and Yehudi. It's a different cut, it's a different species. We're wired differently to the extent there was a great rabbi called Hatam Sofer. Hatam Sofer said that he doesn't understand in his time young men would go to college and learn medicine. And he would say, I don't know what their purpose is in learning the medicine in these colleges because the methods that they're teaching them don't necessarily work on Jews. The Jews have a different body and therefore the medicine that they're prescribing might not work on them. I said, what do you mean, Rabbi? He says, the Gemara of Zara says that Jewish people, their insides are different for two reasons. Number one, we don't eat shekasim and remasim. Our diet is different. Our body is very sensitive. We don't eat these uh, you know, crawling creatures that maybe other nations eat. Somebody once said that, you know, how do you know that Adam Arishon wasn't you know, uh, uh, Chinese? Let's take it for example. So they said because if he was, he would have eaten the steak instead of the apple. The point being is the Goyim eat everything and therefore their bodies are, are different. Their bodies are filled with these items, therefore the medicines that we prescribe are different for them. And then the Gemara says a second reason, because Klav Yisrael is da'igi b'mitzvot. They're worried about mitzvot. They always have a nervousness. What time is Kiryat Shema? What time is Sof Zman Tefillah? Cleaning the house for Pesach making sure you don't miss a word from Megillat Esther, making sure you fulfill the mitzvah of Hadlakat Nero Shabbat Bizman. That's a de'igi, that creates a, a certain pressure, we'll call it. That pressure, which is, according to the Gemara, something that other nations don't have. They don't have that pressure of having to be somewhere and having to watch and having to be concerned about mitzvot. The de'igi and the shekatsim and the matzim causes the Jew to be different in his physical makeup. So the Kuzari is correct when he says it's Datsham and then the fifth level, which is the Yehudi. And Amle Badad Yishkon. Clearly the Torah demands from us to stand apart. There was a rabbi in the Gemara called Alexandri. 
Rabbi Lachsandri had a prayer that he used to make every day after the Amidah. I'll read you the prayer. Rabbi Lachsandri Batar de Matzle, after he finished praying, Amar Achei said the following, Ribona Olamim, God in the heavens, Galui v'yadua lefanecha, it is known to you, God. Sheretzonenu la'atzot lesonecha. You know, God, naturally we want to fulfill your will. Our, our nature is to want to fulfill your desires. Umi be'akev, but who's stopping us? So he says two things. Two things stop the Jew from fulfilling God's will. Number one, he calls it se'or she'be'isa. Se'or she'be'isa means literally the yeast in the dough. That's a nice way of saying the yetzerara. The yetzerara is like yeast in the dough. It causes it to rise and become inflated. That's the yetzerara that goes into the person and brings out his ego. And the second thing he says, she'ibud galuyot. We're in the exile, and in the exile, the nations that are surrounding us, they subjugate us. We're subjected to exile. And that's why we can't fulfill your will. And I said to myself, well, could be when Rabbi Alexandri wrote this prayer, they were living at a time where there were decrees against performing mitzvot. So we had to say, Shabud Malkuyot, there's a gezera not to keep Shabbat, not to circumcise your children, not to keep kasher. The decrees that we're familiar with. So he said, God Almighty, you cannot hold us responsible. We're up against an exile that is subjugating us. But I saw that in some of the Sidurim that we have today, this prayer is still written. And I said to myself, which country in the free world, whether it's here in Canada, whether it's in the United States, or in the majority of the countries where Jewish people live, there is no more Shirbud Galuyot. Nobody is subjugating us anymore. Nobody's telling us we can't fulfill its vote. Nobody's telling us we can't observe. On the contrary, in the countries that we come from, we have freedom of religion, freedom to practice. There's a separation between church and state. We have rights. So where is the shirbud galuyot that he's talking about? It's a sweet exile. It's a, it's a golden exile. It's an exile where Jews are free to serve like no other generation. But Rabbi Lachsandri made that tefillah for all generations, as it made it to the Sidur. And I ask again, where is today the shirbud galuyot, this subjugation of the exiles that doesn't let us serve? Well, I think I have the answer. It's based on, a, on an experiment. The experiment was done by a doctor called Dr. Ash. The famous experiment, it was later followed up in a yeshiva girls' school, in a Bet Yaakov. They did the same experiment, and they got the same exact results. What was it? They took seven students. Six of them were uh, part of the experiment. They knew they were part of the experiment. They were shills. One of them, he was the subject of the experiment, number seven. And they brought all seven into a class. And the teacher went to the blackboard, and he drew two lines using chalk. The first line was about 10 inches long, and the second line was noticeably longer, maybe 12 or 13 inches long. And the way he drew it on the board, it was obvious that the second line on the bottom was longer. The teacher then asked one student at a time, which of these lines is the longer line? And now he went to the kids that were part of the experiment. First kid said, that's an easy question, the top line is longer. Second one, top line is longer. Third one, top line is longer. Fourth, top line, six out of six. That was part of the experiment. They all said the top line is longer. Now they go to the, to the seventh and they said, and what's your answer? And they found something amazing. Even though it was obvious that they were saying the wrong answer. It was obvious that they were making a blatant mistake. But 60% of the time, the seventh student would answer the top line, knowing that he was wrong. And 
the 40% that got the right answer, that didn't care what the other six said, after a little bit of pressure by the other students telling them, what are you talking about? How could you say the bottom line is longer? Don't you see it? It's obvious. 30% of those changed their mind. So the experiment basically taught that when you have pressure from an external source, even if it's doing something that's blatantly wrong, and even if it's something that's clearly not correct, 90% were not able to buck the pressure of those that were part of the experiment. And that's exactly what Shabud Galuyot is. Shabud Galuyot means they're not subjugating us to do anything. But they created a culture of all these anti-Torah concepts and they've legalized it and they've made it as if this is normal practice, that this is considered acceptable. And since we're living in such a society and we are the minority, by being the minority and seeing how everybody accepts these things to be correct and proper and truthful, and nobody thinks twice. That means in a society that has made from dark light and from wrong to right, and a society that has legalized all sorts of perversions, and we're living in this society, our attitudes must be affected. It's impossible that we have pure Torah attitudes because we have not six people telling us, but we have 60 million people telling us. Or I come from 300 million people telling us what is blatantly wrong is actually right. And we're scratching at it and saying, well, the 300 million people saying it's correct and it's proper and government is also agreeing with them. So, you know something? They must be right. That's the Shibud Galuyot. It's not coming because of decrees. It's the persuasion. The fact that today we live in a society that there's so many people that have justified evils and we're part of it. So through osmosis, our values have become diluted as well. Our values have become also compromised and tainted. That's Shibud Galuyot. And that's what Rav Shmuel Birnbaum, the Rosh Hashiva, Allah wa Shalom of the Mir Yeshiva. He once made a very strong observation on a Pasuk. The Pasuk says, Kema'ase eris Mitzrayim, like the actions of the people of Egypt, Ashid Yishav Temba, that you lived in their lands, Lot Ta'asun, do not follow the practices of the Egyptians. And then the Torah goes on for two pages, and tells us about the practices. And without going into too much detail, but these are the most perverted, these are the most horrific practices. This is the highest level of immorality. Says Rav Shmuel Birnbaum, does God have to command us that we shouldn't follow the practices of Egypt? Who would follow this level of decadence? The culture of Egypt was the typification of degeneracy. Says the Rosh Hashiva, does God have to tell the Jewish people, oh, don't emulate them. So he says exactly the point, Dr. Ash's experiment. You're right, when you're not living in Egypt and you look from the outside, you say these people are crazy. But when you're part of the society, and society says this is what we do, and it's legal, and everybody has rights to do this, and it's proper, and nobody will turn their heads, and all of a sudden, what happens to the Jew living in that society? It becomes, in the beginning it's a shock, and then it becomes tolerable, and before you know it, it becomes acceptable, and after a while it becomes normal practice, and that becomes culturally accepted. And all of a sudden the Jew now is so caught up in that whirlwind or that tide of perversion that he doesn't even know his own values. So the Torah has to remind you, you have to detox you lived in Egypt too long. That stuff that they're doing is not Jewish practice. It's not based on Torah values. And therefore we're all victim of this experiment. That's Shabud Galuyot. And it manifests itself, of course, in many ways. It's not my, it's not my place clearly to come 
and give Musar. I don't think that's the purpose of the night, and it's Rosh Chodesh. But our rabbis tell us a simple example. When you get lost through osmosis, we forget our culture. Everybody says that Ahasuerus made a party, and he had everything at the party, but it doesn't say he had music. Strange. I mean, what's a party without music? There's a rabbi called Rav Shlomo El Kabetz. He wrote a sefer on Megillat Esther called Manot HaLevi. He asked that question, where was the music at the party? So he has a couple of theories why Ashverosh didn't have music. He says, one of his answers, he says, music is very satisfying. When somebody's listening to music, it takes him into a different world where he doesn't have to eat or drink. And Hashverosh wanted us to eat and drink because you know, that was the whole purpose of the party, to get drunk and who knows, maybe to make Averot. So he, he didn't want us to get satiated from music. But I saw brought down from another sefer, Ahasuerosh didn't want to put music at the party because then he would have to provide music for every culture. That means he would have to provide Jewish music. And he knew that if he provided good Jewish music at that party, the Jewish people would run out of that party so fast because the music would enter their souls so quick that they'd say, what are we doing here? How do we get sucked into this party? The Jewish music would cause them to run. Ahasuerosh knew that. I wonder today, with some of the Jewish music that we have, I bet you to say a Hashverosh could have had music at the party. And he could have had Jewish music at the party. And nobody would have known the difference. They just would have taken the beats and the regular music of the Goyim and put some Jewish words to it, put some uh, Hebrew words to it, and there you go. And today, try to explain that to somebody, and they don't understand it. What do you mean? Jewish music is Hebrew words. And they don't realize that there's a certain, there's a certain nuance to the music. There's a certain a, a sensitivity to it. Where the Gedolim right away would know if this is considered something that's appropriate or not. I'm not the one to decide. I don't have that sensitivity. But at least they understand that it's possible by living in a country for so long that we don't even know what's right and wrong anymore because it's been so diluted and so compromised. That's a simple example. So it's clear that the years of exile causes a dilution in our Judaism and in our values. But I have a Gemara, which is also in Megillah, that proves that when God sees separation, when God sees the Jewish people acting differently, it arouses so much mercy that it has the ability to save our people from destruction. My proof, well, I have it here. Talk about getting affected by society. It's a Gemara in Megillah, page 12, Amud Bet. Bayom HaShivri, Ketov Lev HaMelech Bayayin. It was on the seventh day of the party. And the king was inebriated. He was drinking wine. So the Gemara asks, Atu ad hashta lo tavli bebe hamra? Hasveros was drinking for 180 days. Now all of a sudden on the seventh day of the party of Shushan, now already he feels inebriated from the wine. What happened until this point? Amar Rava, Rava answers, Yom HaShivi'i, that seventh day, Shabbat Haya. It was Shabbat. Bayom Hashivi'i. Heh Yedi'ah. She Yisrael Ochlim Veshotim. It is on that day that the Jewish people eat and drink. Matchilim Bedevre Torah U Bedevre Tishbachot. And then the eating and drinking leads them to Devre Torah and to singing. When they eat and drink, it leads them to immorality. And then the Gemara goes on to say how they were sitting at the party 
and they were drinking, and all of a sudden they started to talk immorality. Whose wife is be- more beautiful? And it turned into a informal fashion show, and it led to all sorts of hat shalom, things that are filled with tum'ah. So the Gemara says, look at the difference. Look at the difference. So I saw the Gaon the Vilna explain this Gemara. Hold it. The Gemara starts off, Bayoma The Melech over there is a Hashverosh. So the Gemara says, what? He wasn't satiated from wine until this point? And then you tell me the difference between the way we drink and they drink? What is that? Doesn't answer the question. So the Gaon the Vilna says, Hamelech in that Gemara is referring to Kadosh Baruch Hu. Bayom HaShivii is the seventh day, which is Shabbat. Ketov lev HaMelech, HaMelech HaKadosh Baruch Hu. You know what God becomes excited from? Ketov lev HaMelech Bayayin. When he sees the way Jewish people drink wine on Shabbat, Borei Olam becomes excited. Ketov lev HaMelech Bayayin. Why? He says, because look at the difference. The Goyim, they drink wine and they eat, and it leads them to sin. And look at Am Yisrael, on Shabbat, it happens in all of our homes. Of course we have to have a beautiful Sauda. But what does the Sauda lead us to? It leads us to the Vrei Torah la Shulchan. It leads us to speaking stories of Hashkah Piratit. It leads us to singing songs to Kadosh Baruch Hu, and then learning, going to Shi'ur. When God saw the difference between how they react to the Gashmiyut and how we react, Borei Olam says, on this day, that's when the, the tide will turn. Rashti came out, she ends up getting killed, and the road is already paid for Esther Malka to come in and save the day. But what was the catalyst? When God saw the difference between the way they act and the way we act. Ketov lev hamelech, hamelech shel olam, bayayin, when he saw their reaction to wine and our reaction to wine. Now, some of you might not know, but there's a halakha that comes out of this Gemara. The halakha says, on Shabbat, in Minha, when we open the Hechal to take out the Sefer Torah, we're supposed to make a prayer at that moment. We're supposed to say, Va'anit tefillati lecha Adonai et ratzon. Elohim berov hastecha, aneni be'emet yish'echa. We call that moment of mincha on Shabbat et ratzon. It's a time of ratzon. It's a time of acceptance. The Kabbalah says at that moment you're supposed to ask for all of your needs. Mincha, Shabbat. When they take out the separate Torah, it's called et ratzon. What makes it an et ratzon? Why is Minha Shabbat et ratzon? And the Gemara answers. Because what happens right before Minha? We eat lunch, we drink, we enjoy ourselves. And what does it lead to? It leads us going back to Shul and taking out the Sefer Torah. Borei Olam says, ha ha, I see a difference. I see a difference. Nations drinking get inebriated and they commit violence. Their drinking causes them, has for shalom, to commit all sorts of sins and things that are inappropriate. And Am Yisrael, they drink on Shabbat and they eat. And what does it cause them to do? To run back to synagogue, to take out the Sefer Torah. God says, this is called Et Ratzon. It's a time of acceptance. And therefore, you must make, you must make your prayers at that moment. I'll tell you a hidush that I saw from a rabbi called Hida, Haim Yosef David Azulai. He tells us which prayer we should make at that moment. Oh, uh-huh. he tells us what you should pray on Shabbat afternoon when they take out the Sefer Torah because it's et ratzon. That moment is a small window. In medicine, they called it the golden hour to operate. It's a small window. Once we finish Minha, the et ratzon is finished. So how do I know what to pray for? I have so much things to pray for. What should I pray for? So he gives a mashal. This perush I saw in the Hida and Chomat Anach. He wrote a perush called Chomat Anach on the Tehilim in Samechtet. He says there was a king. And the king on his 
coronation, on the inauguration day that he was coronated every year. He would invite all the people of the town to come and you could ask the king any wish you want and the king will grant it. On that day, all the people of the town, they came and everybody was asking wishes and the king of course granted it. There was one very close confidant of the king that the day almost was finished and the king sees him and says, you didn't come to me. Everybody's asking for things. You only have a few more minutes. He says, I don't want to bother. The line was very big. He says, no, 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 no. Ask me. Ask me for anything and I will grant it. So he looks at the king and he says, my dear king, I can't think of something specific now, but my wish to the king is that any time I come during the year and ask the king for something, he'll grant it. The king said, you're a pikeah. You got everything. That means you've taken this etratzon and you've asked God to always answer you whenever you call to him. And since that prayer was made at etratzon, it is accepted. So the Hida says, filati, my prayer, lecha Adonai etratzon. What is my prayer? Elohim berov hasdecha, God with your infinite mercy. Aneni be'emet yishcha. Answer me throughout the year. But I caught that prayer during Etratzon. Now why is it Etratzon? Because God saw a difference. God saw a Havdalah. And I don't believe that it has to be specifically this Havdalah. It could be anything. That any time Borei Olam sees Am Yisrael doing something different, I don't believe our rabbis told us once when we were younger. He said, you know what Etratzon is? He gave us the example. Uh, a man is walking down the street and he sees something and he doesn't look. 99% of the people of the world look. They turn their heads. Some even whistle. Some even make all sorts of uh, noises. He says, when the Jew keeps his eyes straight, that's an etratzon. He says, make any tefillah that you want at that moment and you'll get answered. One of the guys in the yeshiva, I remember, he said, I'm going to try it. And he was in Manhattan and uh, whatever, you know, he walked by him and he just he put his eyes straight down and he made a, a strong prayer to God at the moment. And he came back to the yeshiva the next day, he says, it didn't work. I prayed, I did it, I was kovesh. It didn't work. The rabbi says, impossible. It's brought down in the sefarim. He says, tell me exactly what you did. It says, a temptation presented itself. I put my eyes down. Etratzon, I made a tefillah. And then what? Well, then I turned around. <laughs> oh, that's, you're no different. You're no different than anybody else. That doesn't create etratzon. When two Jews are sitting together, and they're talking for an hour. And nobody's name came up. There was no Lashonara in such a conversation. There was no gossip. Where does that happen? Is it possible for two people to sit for an elongated period of time and the topic of other people doesn't come up? It's only normal. And you have two people that are sensitive to Lashonara and they're careful and they're, 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 they're mincing their words. At that moment, I believe it's Etratzon as well because you're different. Whenever Am Yisrael shows their uniqueness, their specialty, how they're not like everybody else, how their values, the language that spoke, Lashon HaKodesh, Maimonides writes, it's called Lashon HaKodesh because there are no foul words in the Hebrew language. When Klai Yisrael is careful in their Lashon, they're measuring the, 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 not, not what they say, but how they say it, they're different. We go outside the street, every other word is an inappropriate word. And then what happens? We say, well, if everybody's saying the word and we hear it on the radio, uh, how bad can it be? The six students come along and say something, the seventh student says, he must be right. And all of a sudden we find ourselves using these words. And it takes a big sadiq to come along and say, that's not a Jewish word, we don't talk like that. Nor do we listen to this type of music, nor do we dress like that. So sorry, I lost myself, I got caught up in the... Uh, in the culture, I started to believe that night is day and wrong is right. So he says, you know what began 
the miracle of Purim, when God saw Jews walking to synagogue on Shabbat afternoon, and he said, aha, this is what makes Klai Yisrael different. But oh, Hashverosh is making a fashion show, and Klai Yisrael is going to shul after they drank. He was tov at that moment. He was good with the wine of the Klaisel. And the miracle begins. Well, if that's the case, what is the solution to this problem? How do we insulate ourselves? I think the answer is in the second experiment that Dr. Ash did on that day. The second experiment, he took five students. And uh, same experiment with five students. And this time, two students were the experiment, five were the shills. And did the same thing, he drew the lines. Five of them all said, the top line is shorter. And now there's two students there. And the first student comes along and says, no, it's not true, the bottom one is longer. And immediately the second student says, he's right, the bottom one is longer. Now that there were two people saying the same thing, it became much more, they were much more convinced. They were much more sure. And the five started to tell them, what are you talking about? You're wrong. I said, well, no, we're not wrong. You don't know what you're talking. All you needed is one more person to be with those, with that one, and all of a sudden, no matter what pressure the five was giving the two, the two would never change their mind. His conclusion is that you don't need equal amount. It's enough if you have one person that's agreeing with you, that's next to you, and is convinced with your values, it can protect you. How does that manifest itself to us? Well, this is what I heard from my Rosh Hashivas. Every year, some of the guys would continue learning in yeshivas, and other guys would go out to work. And the Rosh Hashiva would make a, you know, a kinus a gathering, and he would talk to those guys that were going out to work. And he would tell them, listen, you must come to the yeshiva on a daily basis. If you don't come to the yeshiva and study Torah on a daily basis, they're going to get you. You need to have a partner. You need to have somebody else that's with you. Otherwise, you'll drown. So you need to come to the yeshiva every day and check in, just so you know that you're part of a, a group. Whether they said it was a dafayomi or a, a shmuz or whatever it was, they were trying to get the guys that are going out to be, to be connected. So the Rosh Hashiva said the following story. It made an impression. He says, there was a farmer many years ago, and he had uh, horses in the, in the barn. And uh, one night, a ganav came, a thief, and he went into the, to the barn, and he grabbed one of the horses, and right away he put it in his uh, truck, and then he uh, went back uh, to take the, uh, the second horse, and as he's taking the second horse, the balabai, the farmer, hears noise in the barn. So he doesn't know what to do. He's in the barn. What is he going to do? So he thinks quickly. The ganav, and he all of a sudden goes on all four like a horse. And the farmer walks in, and he sees one horse, and he sees this guy over here. And he says, "Who are you?" He says, "I'm your horse." He said, what do you mean you're yours? You look like a human being. He said, well, I never told you this, but I was a Gilgul of a human being in a previous life. And thank God, tonight I made my tikkun. And now God just turned me into a human being. He says, wow, I don't believe it. I heard the capitalists always talk about Gilgul Nejamot, and here it is, my horse was a human being. And in front of my eyes, he turned into a human being. So he tells him, okay, get up, get up. And he says, well, now you're going into society. You know what? Let me give you some money. Be matzliya. The farm is giving the ganab money. Be matzliya. What a miracle. Nes gadol. Give me a blessing. And, so, and the ganab says, well, this guy fell for it. And he, he escapes. 
The next day, the farmer now needs to go replace the horse. So he goes to the, uh, to the market. And he goes to the market and he sees, uh, he sees his horse. And he says, that's, that's my horse. He says, but wait, what happened to the Gilgul? So he turns to the horse and he says, Yaakov, you were in the market for one day and you became a horse again. <laughs> and the Rosh Hashiva was giving Musar. He says, now you're in the yeshiva, you're a human being. Be careful that you shouldn't go out and all of a sudden we cannot recognize you. And all of a sudden over one or two days you turn to a horse. Well, you're not discernible. Your values are going to change. And then he went on to explain. He went on to explain the Gemara. The Gemara says that when God gave the Torah Har Sinai, he took the mountain and he placed the mountain over the Jewish people's heads. And he said, if you accept the Torah, mutav. If you accept the Torah, good. Ve'imlav, but if you don't accept it, sham tehekivuratchem, there you will be buried. So the rabbi said, there you will be buried? It should say, here you will be buried. God was gonna take the mountain and place it over them. Shouldn't the pasuk say, what does it mean, sham? I'll tell you when I understood this Gemara. I was in Israel once with my children, and we were, we, was, we spent the night in a city called Elat. Now before you jump to conclusions, we were there because the next day we were going into Jordan to go see Hor Hahar, the mountain where Aharon is buried. And we ended up going into Jordan and we ended up climbing the mountain of Hor Hahar and we actually were able to make Birkat Kohanim on top of Hor Hahar, which is a story in itself. So Elat is on the border. So the tour guide told us the night before, go and buy yourself some sunscreen because it's very, very strong, the sun over there in the mountain. So I took my kids to a convenience store over there and uh, in the store, there were some, unfortunately, Israeli boys and girls, bodies filled with all tattoos and all sorts of jewelry and not appropriate dress, not appropriate speech. My kids at the time were very young and they said, uh, they turn, he turned to me, my kids, and said, Dad, Look at these goyim over here. I said, goyim, why do you say they're goyim? I said, guess what, what if I tell you they're just as Jewish as you? Your mother's Jewish and their mother's Jewish without a doubt. They couldn't believe, how could they be Jewish? I said, this is what happens when you don't have Torah. When you don't have Torah, this is what you look like, but the scary thing is they think they're normal. And they're looking at us like we're from a different planet. That's the scary part, that they're so involved in this, these tattoos to them is considered a normalcy. What they're speaking is considered proper, the way they dress is considered stylish. Once you leave the yeshiva, once you leave Torah, once you're not connected to the Bet Knesset, you need a part, you need at least one. In Torah we call that a havruta. But the synagogue serves that purpose, the Bet Midrash serves that purpose. So I explained the Gemara based on what Rav Kahaneman, the Rosh Hashiva Panavitz said. He said, when God gave the Torah in the desert, he told them, today you're okay. There's not too much, anach- there's not too much uh, 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 toxic uh, culture in the desert where you are. You're protected. However, one day Klai Yisrael is going to move to the society. And one day you're going to live in Rome, and one day in Greece, and one day in the United States, and one day in Canada. And God said, listen to what I'm telling you, that if you don't accept the values of this book, over there you'll be buried in North America you'll be buried in Rome you'll be buried in Israel even Sham. the danger will be in the future if you don't take the book with you somebody else's values will prevail the pasuk says Yosef was thrown into the well 
It says there was no water in the well. The Gemara says, no, water there wasn't. But Nehashim Ba'akrabim there was. Snakes and scorpions there was in the well. The Ba'alim Musar say, the well represents the cavity of the human brain. Vahaborrek, if the cavity of the brain is empty, en bo ma'im, ma'im is Torah, if it's lacking the Torah and its study, don't think that it creates a vacuum. Something is going to occupy that space. And it's not going to be something that's pleasurable. It's going to be nahashim va'akrabim, snakes and scorpions. That represents the decadency of the culture. So I think in Abotai, the lesson is clear. We are victims today of Shabud galuyot. And it's a very, very, uh, it's, it's silent, it's odorless. Nobody's coming with us with a gun, God forbid, or, a, or with, with, with a knife to kill us. Baruch Hashem, we have protection. This is a, a silent, uh, a silent uh, 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 attack. Stealth. Shabud Galayot over is, we're surrounded. Yaakov Abinu said, I stayed by Lavan's house in Lavan Garti. And Rashi right away says, V'taryag mitzvot shamarti, and I kept the taryag mitzvot. V'lo lamadti mima'asa bara'im, and I didn't learn from his bad ways. Rabbi Yaakov Kamenetsky says, of course, if you kept the taryag mitzvot, you didn't learn from his bad ways. He said, no, it's possible to keep taryag mitzvot and still learn from the bad ways of Laban. You could be a taryag Jew keeping everything to the, to, to the letter of the law, but you have the trimmings of the hashkafa, of the nature of the world, whether it manifests itself in dress, in speech, in, in attitude, in values. So Yaakov Abinu said, I had the best of both. Tariyag b'zot velo lamadti mima'asav araim. Last but not least, There's a prayer that we make every day when we leave the Bet Midrash. Uh, we'll do it now when we leave, I guess. It says in the Mishnah, in Berachot, Modim anachnu lefanecha Hashem elokeinu, shesam tahalkenu mi yoshbe Bet Midrash. We thank God you placed us in the Bet Midrash. This is the Bet Midrash. Velo sam tahalkenu mi yoshbe kiranot. You didn't place us with the people who are just wasting their time, Yoshve Kedanot, they're just sitting in, involved in nonsense. And then we come along and say, Shehem Ratzim Ba'anu Ratzim, you know, they're running to their nonsense and we're running to the Bet Midrash and we start to compare ourselves, they're working and we're working. It looks like we're doing the same thing, but it says, Anu Amelimu Mekabdim Sakhar, we're toiling and we're getting reward and they're toiling and they're not getting reward. And I ask myself a question. When do we make this prayer? We make this prayer when we leave the Bet Midrash. I would have made this prayer when you enter the Bet Midrash. We're leaving all the Yoshev Kiranot. We're coming into the yeshivas. We're in the yeshiva and everybody else is outside. But here it says, B'yitziyato. So I have a new way of learning this prayer. B'yitziyato is talking about guys like us who don't have the zikhut to sit and learn 22 hours a day in the yeshiva, the kolel. We have to go make a living. Be yitziyato. You went to shul in the morning, you learned the dafayomi, and now be yitziyato. You're leaving to go to work. However, the Jew that goes to work, he's still connected to the Bet Midrash. He could be in the Kiranot, but he has a status of Yoshve Bet Midrash. That's why the halakha says, when you make Birkat Torah in the morning, and then you go to work, you don't have to make it again when you come back in the evening to learn. Why? Isn't it a hefsek? A person sits in the sukkah in the morning, he says, L'shev v'sukkah. He goes to work, he comes home, he sits in the sukkah, he has to say L'shev v'sukkah again. Why is it that Birkat Torah, one blessing lasts the whole day? And Tosfot answers, because the proper Jew, he never has a hefsek. When he goes to work, his mind is still, when am I coming back? And everything he does in the office is halachic. 
the laws of Rebit, the laws of paying workers on time, the laws of Shabbat, the laws of Ona'ah, everything is a, a question. So there's no Hefsek. That means it's possible to be in the Kiranot and still be Miyoshve Bet HaMidrash. And that's what we're saying. When you leave the Bet Midrash to go to work, to the Kiranot, you say, that you put my place in the Kiranot like a Yoshve Bet HaMidrash. That even though I'm outside, it's like I'm inside. And that's what the Gemara said, Baruch Ata Ba'ir, Sheteheh Bet HaKeneset, Samuch LeBetcha. It says that who is blessed? Somebody that his home is next to the synagogue. Of course, I think it means simply, geographically, one that's home is in walking distance to the synagogue, he's blessed. But I think the deeper understanding of that Gemara means the values of the synagogue and the values of his home are close. Betcha samuk lebet keneset. You don't have two sets of value. That you always consider your shvibet abedrash. You take the values of the synagogue and they're closely related to the values in your home. And then, even if you're outside in the world, you're amle badad. You're like the hen, you're like the two letters that don't combine with any other two letters. And that's the lesson of being apart and staying apart. Yes, being a part of the synagogue of the Bet Midrash, but staying apart from the other parts of creation that are not like us. They are not the Ige B'mitzvot. They are not eating the same foods. Therefore, they're different like the Kuzari said. We're the fifth part of creation. We're not Medaber. We're considered Yehudi. And Rav Birnbaum was right. The culture could make us think that even darkness is light. Even the Torah of Mitzrayim, if you're living in it, you need God to tell you, don't do it, it's wrong. The good news is that every time that God sees us doing something different, that's an etratzon. Whether it's on Shabbat coming to shul in Minha, whether it's keeping our eyes straight, whether it's watching our mouths during a dibur, or watching the language that we use, God says, And at that point, Yeshua start to begin. And that's when salvation starts to begin. And I pray, an event like this is an etratzo. People come out on an icy night, hundreds of people, knowing that they can hear words of the Vre Torah, uh, who does this? And they give siddakot at the same time, and they're hearing ideas that are somewhat painful. It's stinging musar. And Christ says, yes, it's a good musar. We have to accept upon ourselves to be a little more what we bring into the house. The house should be close to the Bet Knesset in, in Kedushah levels. And then, Be'azat Hashem, let this be an etros, and everybody should make a prayer at this moment. I know I will. But don't pray for something specific. Pray like the, the friend of the king told him. My dear king, I don't have too much time to ask you for something specific, but answer my will that any time I come and ask you for something, you will grant it. That now is an etratzon. May God answer us with his mercy. Amen.